From the US company Abyss comes the review of their middle child, the Diana Phi. The Abyss lineup consists of the Diana V2, the Diana Phi, and the AB1266, price point at $3,000, $4,000, and $5,000. Now, these prices have changed recently due to inflation and Honestly, I have no idea what the reason was behind it because none of the specifications or the materials or the accessories have changed. So it's best to check the most recent and up-to-date prices down below in the description. With a special thanks to Jez for lending us this unit for review. Welcome to the sick edition of Convince Me Audio's Diana Fi. Let's attempt to talk. Like I stated, this is their middle child, the Diana Phi, but unfortunately, recently, this has been replaced with the Diana TC. They've not touched the Diana V2, and they've not touched the AB1266, so I'm rather curious what the difference between this unit is and the Diana TC. Hopefully, that will come in for review at some point very shortly, and I will reach out to Jez again to borrow this um, so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. It's interesting they actually decided to upgrade this unit rather than the 1266 or the Diana V2. Now, um, if you've been a long-time subscriber of the channel, you will remember that the Diana V2 was one of my favorite headphones of all time because of its tuning and beautiful, dark, warm sound signature, relaxed nature, comfort and design. That headphone holds a special place in my heart. So I was rather excited to actually unbox and see this one. Now it comes in exactly the same style housing and boxes uh, with the outer shell like so. Um, and you got this beautiful magnetic clasped box like so with the engraving etched on top of the cardboard up here with a magnetic clasp like so. Very Apple-esque like I previously mentioned. And then we get this double zipper canvas back again as usual. Let us dispense with this uh, very, 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 very slim light box. Now this is the sort of box that you, most of you will probably end up throwing away. Okay, pulling the headphones towards us. Now I can immediately see that they've paid a lot more attention to the logo. I don't remember the V2 uh, canvas bag having such a prominent, nice logo with leather stitched around the edges. I mean, I complained a lot about this case previously and I still have the same gripes, to be honest with you. I mean, the idea and the conception of this is completely fine. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's small. It's something that can fit in a backpack. It's extraordinarily light. It's not very protective. But uh, this headphone has been run over by a Jeep, um, so I don't think uh, durability is an issue. Um, you should check out the Abyss channel for that, it's incredible. Makes you a little sad as well uh, to actually see a $4,000 headphone being run over with a Jeep. But hey, um, as we unzip the double zippers, I wish these zippers were on the side so that we get more of an opening when we lift this lid like so. Um, with a headphone nestled inside, because when you take out the headphones in this manner, those zips have got a tendency to grab the leather pads. Now, this is the same JPS Labs uh, cable as previously. It looks like a network cable, but a little bit softer. Nutrix type of connector. Uh, this one is a four pin XLR. You can get this in 2.5, uh, 3.5 and uh, 6.3, I believe on the website. The other end, consists of a pair of 2.5 millimeter connection. Now these connections uh, are almost proprietary, but not quite because you can use other 2.5 ended cables, but they have to be extraordinarily thin housing so that it can fit inside the socket, which I will show you momentarily. Um, they're very fragile. They disconnect very easily, which is a good thing, I suppose, if you tug it. Uh, as you can see here, there is a triangular shape etched out on the side of the 2.5 connector so that it goes as far as the edge, like so. Uh, you can't push it up any further and it just sort of locks into place. Um, I've only seen this design with Abyss. It is what it is. Um, previously on my Diana V2, I actually replaced the cable. Um, so if you're interested in third-party custom cables, 
um, I recommend checking out my buddy Pete down below at Double Helix. Uh, he makes some extraordinarily good cables with very, very exotic cores, etc. If that is something that takes your fancy. Now, as we uh, dig inside shower bag, this one actually comes out a lot easier than the V2 did. That was a lot more um, ergonomically cumbersome. Let us throw this case here. Actually, before we do, let me show you something else as well. This foam is inside and it's exactly the same shape as the headphone so that it can sit inside it pretty nicely, which is a nice touch. So the headphone does not rattle around, obviously, during travel. Um, I can't wait to see the 1266 and what type of casing that comes in. And um, Abyss headphones are extraordinarily durable. So happy days. Now, finally, these are the headphones. The Diana V2 comes in coffee and black. The Diana Phi comes in metallic gray, or gunmetal gray as some people would call it, and a beautiful bronze color. But as you can see, this one, this one is unique. This is because the previous owner contacted Abyss and asked for this paint job custom. Now, Abyss provides this if you're willing to put out the cash. $1,500 if I'm not mistaken. Um, you might think it's worth it. If you're planning to keep these forever, the choice is yours. We always love a choice. Now, this housing is exactly the same as the Diana V2. It's a singular construction from headband to cup. Very, very stiff, very rigid. So, that brings us to the first problem. If this shape does not fit your head, if your head is too large, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. This headphone is absolutely tiny. Oh, listen to those magnetic adjustments. I think this might be some of the best in the industry, honestly. Uh, between this and the Meze Audio Elite and Empyrean, just listen. It's magnetic, it's freaking awesome. My Diana V2 had the DMS mod. That was for the pad and the headband. This headband is just the basic one you get from Abyss. It's one piece of leather, extraordinarily uncomfortable, hot spot inducing, and a nightmare. So, my recommendation is, if you are planning to buy one of these, uh, seen as these have been discontinued off of the used market, contact ZMF, contact Zach, and ask for the pilot pad. That is a piece of leather that will stick underneath this, making this twice as thick, twice as comfortable, and very ergonomic. I absolutely loved it on the Diana V2. I found it had no comfort issues whatsoever. Fortunately for me, this shape fits my head perfectly. The cups do not rotate forward or back, or tilt backwards and forwards. It's very, very stable, stiff, and in this manner. So if this does not fit your head shape, you can't tilt it forward like so or tilt it back. It's just the way it is. We have the beautiful Abyss logo here, etched. I think they laser etched some of this stuff. It's the construction, trust me on this, is absolutely freaking spectacular. This is a $4,000 headphone. Taking both of the pads off, we gently lift the headphones up here. As you can see, extra ordinarily thin, extraordinarily light. This thing only weighs 350 grams. Now for a planar headphone, this is nothing short of a miracle. These are the drivers. It's a 63 millimeter transducer. It's the same driver as the Abyss 1266. A 350 gram headphone uh, for a planar, especially planar in the flagship category, is very rare. I think, in fact, this might be the lightest I've come across. Um, I'm trying to remember the Lyric was uh, 393. The LCD5 behind me is a 420 gram headphone. The Svaras are up there as well. Um, so, extraordinarily light, extraordinarily small and very big sound. As we take a tour around the headphones, this is the 2.5 millimeter connection. As you can see, it's very recessed. So you need to have a very, very, very tiny jack 
housing like these. These are absolutely tiny. So make sure when you're getting custom cables, you tell them exactly what headphones is for because otherwise you're gonna have trouble. Okay, let me take off one of the pads because there's something I wanna show you. Now I'm gonna set the headphones aside here. Um, there is this mesh, ultra transparent mesh to cover the drivers and protect the drivers. Now these pads can be rotated in a variety of directions so that you can actually get the best comfort and the sound changes with every single one. So the stitching at the bottom here, for me personally, is bottom and back, like so. Some people have this up top here like this. When I do this, the back is completely open for me. Uh, and some people have it here, like so, or at the bottom front, like so. That completely depends on your head shape and um, to get the best seal. So I can't actually talk for you guys, but for me personally, the best seal, the perfect seal I get, including with the Diana V2, is the stitching being at the back bottom, like so. Here's the etched driver, obviously. It's a single-sided planar. This headphone is a 32 ohm headphone, but the sensitivity is 91 dB, so alongside Aria. Aria, I believe from memory, was 92. These are not easy to drive headphones, not if you're planning to drive them properly. And trust me, on equipment, it makes a difference. We will talk about that uh, in the sound section, because I did run it on a variety of different systems. Spec lowdown, 350 grams, 32 ohms, 91 dB sensitivity, 63 millimeter driver transducer, including these coupling and decoupling magnetic design pads, which change the sound depending on which variation of the angle of the pad you have it on your head, 2.5 millimeter connection. I think that covers about everything. Obviously single-sided planar, like I mentioned. Okay, housekeeping out of the way. Let's get the overall sound quality of these headphones. To answer your question first of all, do these deserve the moniker of high-end flagship? Not the lower tier flagship of Aria, LCDX, etc. Not the mid-tier category of Verite Closed, Atrium, Diana V2, Focal Stelia, etc. No. This is in the category of LCD5, up there, Hi-Fi Mensa's Varas, Final Audio D8000 Pro, Utopia. This headphone is exceptional. If this was 2020 and not 2022, and I was reviewing these at the same time as I did the Diana V2, these would have been an instant buy for me. These headphones are resolving, ridiculously transparent. They have a dark tuning sound signature akin to the um, Verite Closed and Atrium, yet with good treble extension so that it actually feels like a bright lit sunset rather than a more laid back dark one like the Diana V2. You get a lot more treble extension and also in the upper mid range, it's a little bit more forward. But this is the tuning I personally prefer. The Atrium, the Diana V2, the Focal Stelia, the Diana Phi, even to a certain extent the LCD5 because it's a little bit brighter than this but it conveys the same sound signature. Stage is uh, moderate on this headphone. Bass response is wonderful. We have a very punchy characteristics of the frequency response, um, depending on what equipment you use. Sub bass is very, very well pronounced, very well textured. Not quite on the levels of the final audio. Those are like subwoofers. This is a lot more uh, leaner. This is more a lot more of the planar-esque type of sub bass, where it's very quick, very lean, very apparent. In fact, actually, um, as a rule, I'm genuinely surprised every time bass kicks in on these headphones because you have these tiny things on your head. I mean, they're extraordinarily small. Let me actually get the LCD fives out so that you can see side by side comparisons. Right. Yeah, these are much bigger. So if we do a side by side comparison, um, let me close these so that they're on the same playing field. Look at this compared to this, you know? 
This is a much, 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 much bigger headphone. Um, I wish these uh, Diana Fies lay flat the way these do. This is absolutely exceptional. Um, the review for this should be out before the Diana Fi, by the way, so um, you can do side comparisons because there's going to be a lot of comparisons between these two. Um, they, they are very similar. Going back to the base region on this headphone, it always surprises me every single time. Um, there is a little bit of a peak in the upper mid range, which we will discuss in the frequency response breakdown, but um, it's never become too annoying. It's never become too fatiguing. Um, the sound signature of this headphone is smooth. It's actually really beautiful and the timbre is wonderful on it. Legitimately, I think the timbre exceeds the LCD5. Um, it's, it's instantly noticeable, instantly, and vocals are really present as well. So, with that overall sound characteristics, let's break down the frequency response. Using a track to break down the frequency response as we normally do on this channel lately, uh, using one of my most difficult tracks to actually test these true flagship headphones, Hans Zimmer's Pirates of the Caribbean Suite. I've linked previously in the comment section and I will link it again in this review. For those of you who have not checked out that track, it's one of the most complicated tracks I've ever come across. There is 50 instruments, a very broad stage and Every instrument is real, obviously. It's a classical track. It's a live reproduction, and uh, it's one of the most complicated tracks for a driver to actually reproduce. And there are a lot of caveats in that track that highlight the weaknesses of drivers. Starting with the sub bass, it's actually very, very, very present. It's not as elevated or as instantly grabbing as a final audio. I think it's more alongside the LCD 5's type of sub bass when you power these headphones properly. It's strong, authoritative, and very, very apparent. So for example, when the track kicks in and you got the double bass and you got those wind instruments really, really, really authoritatively hitting those notes, the sub bass kicks in and instruments have a beautiful deep body. You can hear the resonance of the cabin of the wind instruments and of the wood instruments. It doesn't feel thin or small sounding. Honestly, this headphone sounds a lot larger than it looks. It's, it's kind of mesmerizing that way. I think it might be a little elevated over the LCD5 by probably about one or two dB in the sub bass category. It's definitely a lot easier to drive than the LCD5 and Synergy is a lot easier with that. So already the wind instruments and the string instruments of this Hans Zimmer track is already apparent. It's immediately apparent that there is authoritative power there. You can hear the resonances and your eardrums does tingle with that sub bass. Texturally, tactile information and micro detail, I say the LCD5 is definitely a higher resolution headphone than the Diana Phi. Um, this becomes a trend throughout the frequency response between the LCD5 and the Diana Phi. The drivers in the LCD5 are quicker, more transparent and higher resolution. As we climb up to the mid bass, they are both elevated around the same spot. So around 125 Hertz or so, you do get the punch and the impact from both of them. Um, this is easier to obtain with the Phi. I can throw it on the Serene behind me. I can throw it on the OR behind me or on the AHB2 and get the same variation of power, authority and control. With the LCD5, it's a little bit more picky and it likes the awe. The Serene can't push it as hard. The Serene has been the best synergized amplifier for the Diana Phi. When we're looking at EDM tracks uh, from Infected Mushroom or Monster Cat, it's an extraordinarily engaging headphone. Um, it's very punchy, very visceral, and you really do kind of get the full attack of the kick drum with the Diana Phi. LCD5, same concept, 
just higher resolution. You can hear more around the instrument. Um, spatial presentation, I think they're on par, to be honest. Um, this Dianify really separates very well in the bass region. It's not quite on the levels of Sazvara, obviously, or the final audio we reviewed previously. That was a more controlled and a more detailed bass region, and it very, very much felt like a subwoofer-esque, but this is an extraordinarily good headphone. Um, in this category. I think it trade blows with like the LCD5 as certain aspects, but um, the resolution and the speed can't be denied. The LCD5 does take it, but it's a brand new driver. It's only been released 2021, I think it was. So it's new technologies, etc. They're both single-sided planars. That's why they're both so light, which is wonderful. I'm glad this is the trend we are actually going across the industry because the Meze Audio is the same concept. And, um, you lose none of the detail and you lose none of the performance and you still get these extraordinarily high-end, high-resolving headphones. Climbing it up to the upper bass region, it does not bleed into the mids, same as the LCD5. They are both very, very controlled. They both assist the treble region very, very well. And especially with tom-toms and attacks, so when the Hans Zimmer track uh, swells and we get the classical drums, they do not sound thin in the slightest. mid-range. Okay, this is where these two headphones trade blows, and I think in one aspect of the mid-range, the LCD5 takes it, but we'll get onto that momentarily. The lower mid-range is slightly dark on the Dyna Phi, ever so slightly, so that it gives this dark sound signature in the mid-range, not by much, just by a very, very small amount, on the LCD5, it's lush, it's forward, it's very, very engaging. The mid-mids on both of them are forward, open, very revealing, ultra-addictive. Vocals really pop on these two headphones. They are pretty similar, honestly. Um, spectacular. The LCD5 on the OR, the Diana5 on the Holo Audio Serene. You feel as though there is no gap between you and the singer. Um, they really do pop and it's as though you can actually peer behind the singer and actually see the environment in your mind's eye behind the singer's vocals, which is wonderful. They sort of like pop up here in a holographic manner. They're both not in your face, slightly laid back in the vocal region, but it's, it's still quite intimate. You still kind of feel as though you can see the expressions on the singer's faces on both of them. Climbing up to the upper mid-range, okay, this is where we get some trouble. Using Hans Zimmer's track again, obviously, the Pirates of the Caribbean, when the track swells, there is a few things in this track that we have to separate. The mastering, the peak of the frequency response where these instruments collide together, um, a little bit of distortion, and most importantly, the coherency of a multitude of instruments hitting the same frequency response simultaneously. Now, this can cause a wall of sound effect on some headphones. This can cause distortion on some other drivers. And this can cause a feeling of congestion on some other drivers as well. So we need to separate all of these. On the Diana Phi, it does come across using the Holo Audio May, the IFI Signature, and the DAC3B with varying results. The DAC3B being the least amount of resolving compared to the Signature, then obviously the Holo Audio May. Um, you get a bit of distortion in the upper mid-range where the track tends to create this wall of effect sound when the track crescendos into this absolute high-end attack and peak from all the instruments. Um, the LCD5 creates this same wall of sound effect as well because the upper mid-range is still not as tactile and resolving as the hi fi Vara and as the final audio D8000 Pro. But on the Diana Phi, it comes across a little more distorted rather than a little more separated and 
defined, but still giving that wall of sound effect as it does on the LCD5. Uh, both of these headphones, I think this is their weak point. Because what they've tried to do is fill that part of the frequency response so it coherently corresponds to the ear so that you've got good ear gain there. But this, due to the nature of the drivers on both of these headphones, can come across a little less performing than the mid mids, lower mids, bass region and treble and in the same concept this one as well. I think this track, I've never heard it sound as good as it does on Sesvaras on any other headphones yet, but the Stax X9000 I've not tested properly yet either, so we will see. Or the 1266 actually for that matter. Hopefully with a bit of luck that will come in for review very shortly. So this is the weakest part of this headphone, the upper mid range. Is it so bad that it breaks the headphones? Not by a long shot. You are looking at a flagship $4,000 headphone. And now this has been discontinued. You can find it on the market for $3,000 and it's an absolute freaking steal. Trust me on that. It's an easy listen. Climbing up to the uh, treble region, it's a lot more forward on the LCD5 um, than the Diana 5. This is a bit more relaxed. You get good detail in the lower treble region. You get good detail in the mid treble and you get good air in the upper treble region. Stringed instruments uh, definition is very well presented on the strings and on the body of the instrument. Uh, saxophones and clarinets and stuff are really well presented. It doesn't feel overly congested. It doesn't feel overly forward. It's a very smooth sound signature. It's a very pleasing sound signature. Is it as warm and luscious and organic as the Diana V2? No, but it's not far behind. That headphone is a lot more forgiving to badly mastered tracks, but if the track's mastered well, this will show its detail. This will show its performance. It's actually extraordinarily resolving. So that gives you a vague idea of the frequency response. Without measurement, it's a little bit difficult um, because you're going off of my impressions and these pads, which are, I believe, the original pads. Don't think these pads are the brand new ones. They've started shipping with their headphones. I think this is the actual stock. It's a little bit stiff. So it's definitely not as lush as the Diana V2 one. That was absolutely incredible. It was like Alcantara type of leather. It was insane. Beautiful, beautiful uh, leather pads. Uh, these ones are a bit more, I think these are pleather. These don't feel like leather, man. These are like, mm, yeah, I don't think these are real leather. If they are, they've got this weird kind of rough texture that feels a bit pleathery. I don't know, not a fan. But um, tuning wise, yeah, great, fantastic. So take that with a pinch of salt because um, you can get the DMS mod pads for this or the V2 pads for this or the new pads. But all my assessment has been done on these pads, which are, I believe, the stock. Okay, let's talk about equipment pairing. So like I stated throughout the frequency response, um, this headphone was driven balanced with the Hollow Audio Serene behind me. It's a pre, but it puts out three watts of power and it's one of the most beautiful tuned amplifiers for headphones, honestly. It, it does pack a punch. Um, I tested it on the firm stack, the OR. It sort of smooths things over on the OR and it's a little bit overly warm and you lose a little bit of the detail. It's a bit more laid back, but the Serene is a lot more clearer, open, um, and a lot more defined in the detail part of the frequency response. On the AHB2, it's a, it's a power amp, bass region performs much better. It's much, much harder hitting. Um, separation is actually better on the uh, AHB2 than the Serene and definitely than the OR for this headphone specifically because they're pretty damn hard to drive. Um, Aria shone on the AHB2 as well. So serious headroom on the AHB2, but it does sound a little dry. So bear that in mind. DAC makes a difference on this headphone. It's very resolving and you can apparently and immediately tell the difference, like the uh, LCD5. With the DAC3B from Benchmark, the LCD5 did not perform overly great for real instruments. Um, it's a little bit sharp, a little bit forward, exacerbating the treble region of the LCD5, which is very well extended and a little bit forward at times, depending on the amplifier you use. 
um, better on the AUR and the DAC-3B together because of the sound signature of the AUR, but as a rule, the DAC-3B on the Diana's exacerbated. So I suppose that brings us to the caveat section, exacerbated uh, the upper mid-range where it became a little too forward, where more often than not things sounded a little sharper than they were supposed to be. It kind of takes away from the kind of organic nature. It's a little bit too forward, a little bit too analytical, a little bit too dry, and especially for electronic music it does actually become quite fatiguing. Um, another kind of odd thing that happens with the Diana Phi when you put it on something like the DAC-3B or the signature behind me is that the sound stage collapses. The sound signature of the stage, the performance of the stage becomes a triangular shape like this. So you get left and right and center. These three points in space are a lot louder dynamically than anything else around it. Um, but with the May, the whole stage becomes a semi-sphere so that you're like this sitting on the edge of the um, auditorium and everything else ends up being in front of you like so. Um, but with those other DACs, because of their capability and staging, the Diana uh, does become a triangular shaped performance like this. So does the LCD5 in fact actually. These two headphones are quite close in regards to needing very high-end equipment to shine truly. Um, so that's why some reviewers say that the staging on the Diana Phi is kind of triangular. You get a loud central image here, you get images left and right here and they're not too far out. You can't really identify the depth and everything else in between is a little bit more blurred. But if you put a May or a Dave on this headphone, the stage completely opens up. It opens up the floor space for a much more natural, a much better, much wider, much more even uh, spatial presentation. Some of the other caveats being obviously these 2.5 connectors uh, are proprietary almost because of the narrowness of the housing, which is a bit annoying. You need to fix the headband on this headphone uh, with a pilot pad because it's just a piece of very hard leather which causes hot spots. Uh, apart from that, oh yes, uh, and the fit. It will fit you or it won't fit you. There is no middle ground. Uh, and for some people with this original stiff pad, the, it will dig into your temples here because it's very stiff. There is no movement, so hit and miss basically. But I think the new pads they're shipping with these have uh, alleviated this issue because what uh, Abyss did was take the DMS mod, uh, kick him to the side and say, okay, we're going to create this uh, DMS mod pads for our new headphones. And now this is what's been shipped. Um, with all of their headphones, including the Diana V2, as far as I'm aware. But I think uh, DMS assisted them with this pad. I mean, he was the one who, s who actually created this mod originally for the community, and, uh, and I tried it, and a lot of other people tried it, and a lot of Diana V2s still sell with those, so. Tamba on this headphone is extraordinarily good, actually. It's, it's very, very surprising. Um, Instruments immediately sound realistic. Pianos, drums, saxophones, violins, cellos, they all instantly are capturing the essence of the instrument. With the resonance of the cabinet, with the resonance of the room, and its tonal balance of the instrument is very correct. Setting aside the tonal balance of the frequency response, but the tonal timbral information of instrument is very correct on this. Vocals are very, very apparent, vibrant, and visceral, and they pop within the stage with clear definition from the lower part of the frequency response to the mids to the treble region. They never feel like they're overly fatiguing, overly tuned, they just sound natural. S's, T's, and CH sounds all come across very naturally. Honestly, it's a very transparent driver so that it feels as though you can actually see the impressions of the vocalist on their face when they're singing. Uh, dynamics on this headphone is okay, it's pretty good. Uh, quiet sounds never really feel lost if you're using a very high-end chain. I'm telling you this now because I get too many comments and I have to argue with too many people. 
When you have a $4,500 headphone and you come and you attack me and say, amplifiers and DACs barely make any difference. And then I find out you're using a $1,000 to a $1,500 setup on a $4,000 to a $6,000 headphone and demand that your impressions is the right one is not only flawed, but it doesn't help our chat and our community either. I've had to argue with so many people in regards to Sazvaras and in regards to other headphones, how little DAX and amps make a difference to the driver. This is incorrect, especially with resolving drivers like this, like the Sazvaras, like the Utopias, you're in a different category of performance. Every nuance of DAX and amps becomes apparent. Whether you can hear it or not, that's subjective, but it does make a difference. I mean, I've got some of the most high-end chains behind me. We've had some of the highest chains here, and sometimes it's not the highest end chain that actually synergizes well with these headphones or other headphones. A lot of people say the um, Chord Dave amplifier is not that good, and yet on the Atrium is absolutely God. So synergy it plays a big role, headroom plays a big role, and quality plays a very big role too. Conclusion. What do we think of this headphone? Does it have a place in 2022? How is it performing against the Utopia's LCD5s and all the other high-end flagships in our audio space right now? Well, the conclusion for this headphone is it's still a superb headphone. The fact that it's discontinued, the insurance and warranty situation, you can grab this on the used market for like 3000 or below, and I think it's an absolute steal. It's a very comfortable headphone if it fits your head, because if it fits your head, it's amazing. It's a very small headphone that you can take everywhere with you. They are hard to drive, but they can sound good on a lot of things, unlike these ones, which can go from eh to oh my freaking god. They are a lot more picky. Would I own one of these? If I didn't have this, most definitely. I would fix the headband with the pilot pad. I might invest in the V2 pads for this and call it part of my collection. The 2.5 connector really annoys me, but be that as it may. This is a wonderful headphone. It's a smooth sounding headphone. When you feed it the right DAC and amp, you don't even need to worry about EQ. A lot of people do EQ uh, a lot of headphones because of their environment. I'll give you an example. If you only own one setup, and if you can only afford one setup, but the headphones don't sound right on it, this is a good opportunity to play about with a frequency response. Bring down the treble a little bit, for example, not for this headphone, but in general, of an headphone. Increase the sub bass a little bit, because the output stage of your DAC doesn't have enough power, doesn't sound controlled enough, because the mid-range is not lush enough, or there's a problem with the mid-range, or the mid-mids, or the upper-mids, and you just tweak it a little bit by one or two dB, creating this beautiful environment for yourself, that's fine. But know this, the chain will make a difference on these sorts of transparent drivers. And if you're fortunate enough to own such chains like there is behind me for CMA, for testing headphones, you find that the frequency response smooths out the way the headphone is supposed to be performing. You find there aren't any peaks in the treble region that actually require EQ. You find the sub bass performs the way it's supposed to without requiring EQ. I'll give you an example for the LCD5. It can sound a little lacking in the sub bass region if the chain is not right, but put the LCD5 on the Dave and the OR, you don't need to touch anything about this headphone. So bear that in mind. And also, preferences is key and EQ is free. So there is always that as well. So you won't lose anything by EQing. I don't like it. I don't care for it. 
I have absolutely nothing against people EQing though. But know that there are other options before EQ and you've got to know what you're doing. Um, so that's the Diana Phi. Let's talk about scores. Build quality and construction. Four tigers. Um, I don't give it five because it's uncomfortable. Um, I give it four tigers because I don't think you can break this thing. This is absolutely incredible. <laughs> this is this abyss. Abyss knows how to make a headphone. They really do. Uh, functionality and ergonomics. Three tigers. That's because the headband could have been thicker. I think they've replaced that. So um, maybe if the new one comes in for the like uh, Diana V2 and stuff, we can revisit this. The 2.5 insert connectors, which is a bit annoying. I mean, they could have uh, they could have just had a flush and made life a lot easier for everybody. But yeah, it is what it is. Um, and the fact that it's so stiff, you know, you can't tilt it forward and back and stuff. That's it is what it is. It's it's their design, and that is sad because a lot of people can't wear this. Sound quality. Four solid tigers. This is this is good. This is exceptional. This is in the true flagship category. Ergonomically light. You can't take that away. 350 grams for this thing. How many tigers do I give you? Because it's in a very, very busy environment of final audio, LCD5, even Sasvara's, if you find it used. I love this headphone. I want to give it four tigers but I can't because the place it's coming in, it's too busy. But if you can buy this used at $3,000, that changes the game as well, because this has been discontinued and it takes away nothing from it. This has the same driver as the 1266, just slightly smaller. And it's more ergonomic than the final audio that lost a couple of tigers for that. That headphone is a wonderful headphone, but this is tiny. So, without further ado, three extraordinarily large Siberian tigers for this. Just missing out four tigers by about this much. I'll put you alongside the final audio D8000 Pro. Well done, Abyss. Until the next review, with a bit of luck, maybe the AB1266. This is the final Abyss review. I'll see you next time. Peace. Oh, consider joining Patreon. All of these reviews are released there first. You get to join the private Telegram chat and we get to yell about audio equipment. If not, subscribe, press the like button and jump into the public Telegram chat. And I will see you there momentarily. Put in the comment section if you own these headphones and how your experience has been. Let's chat. Peace.